I don't think you need that, do you? Do what? Way on down the road. So if you're waiting on me, you're backing up. Huh? I'd like to welcome everyone to our class tonight. Uh, Steve Moore, again, will be leading our class uh, here in just a minute. And Michael Brooks will be leading us uh, in song. Um, quickly, a couple of announcements that we want to make from here. Uh, don't forget to pick up an announcement sheet off the Welcome Center that's got some extra announcements that I won't be making from up here. Uh, but we do want, I do want to go over some things on the prayer list. Uh, Alan Dodson underwent a procedure uh, last Thursday to help his blood flow to his foot uh, that he had uh, partially uh, had his foot amputated. So uh, we want to remember him. Rachel Gibbs is healing uh, from her COVID and uh, she appreciates our prayers uh, for her complete healing on that. John McPherson uh, had surgery for a brain bleed uh, back a couple of weeks ago. He's uh, home now, and uh, we want to remember him in prayer. And uh, thanks uh, to God for the healing he's had so far. Uh, Joe Sims had surgery to take a cancer off his ear. It turned out better than what they had thought, so uh, he's at home doing well, too. Uh, Tom Taylor, uh, last week, uh, had to clear a vein blockage in his leg, and he had a stent placed. So we want to remember uh, Tom at this time, too. And also, uh, Elizabeth Mitchell, that's uh, David Mitchell's mother, uh, is not doing well. Uh, they don't really expect her to make it uh, through the night. Uh, he's not even home. He's on his way home. Uh, but David's sister's there with her, so we want to remember Elizabeth and David and uh, their family at this time. Uh, that's all the announcements that I'll make from here. Uh, we'll have a prayer, and then Michael will lead our song, and then we'll have our class. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for the opportunity to be here. We're thankful that we're able to open up your word and to study and to, to learn more about your will. We pray that you'll bless us in our class tonight. Father, we're mindful of those that... Uh, are ill and those that have had surgeries uh, for Alan Dodson and Rachel Gibbs and John McPherson and Joe Sims and Tom Taylor. We pray your continued blessings on them, uh, that they will be fully recovered uh, from the issues that they have. Father, we want to uh, remember the Mitchell family at this time for Elizabeth as uh, it seems that uh, she will pass from this uh, world very soon. And we just pray for her, for peace and comfort and also for David and his sister and their whole family. We pray that you'll bless them through this time. Help us uh, to help them through a, a time like this. Father, continue to bless us. We pray that you'll forgive us uh, when we don't live up to what you would have us to be, and that you'll help us as we strive to do better. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Our song before our lesson will be number 712, Jesus is Coming Soon. And I want you to notice, and I, I, I told uh, our, our distinguished teacher here that, that troublesome times are here, had no comment with the class coming up. So I, I just didn't want to offend anybody. I want you to do one thing for me, make one change for me. And if you don't want to, I won't know it, so don't worry about it. But I'm going to ask you to do one change, and that is many will meet their doom. Just to give it a, a quick slant, a positive slant, many will meet their groom, okay? Because Christians are going to meet their groom. And I want to sing it one time like that, and then we can go back to the old way anyway. But both of them are correct, so that's okay. Troublesome times are here, filling men's hearts with fear. Freedom we all hold dear, now is at stake. Humbling your heart to God, saves from the chastening rod. Seek the way pilgrims trod, Christians awake. My Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their groom, trumpet 
trumpets will sound. And all the dead, dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Love us so many cold, losing their home of gold. This in God's word is told, evils abound. When the signs come to pass, nearing the end at last, it will come very fast, trumpets will sound. My Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon, many will meet their groom, trumpets will sound. And all the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bound. Troubles will soon be o'er, happy forevermore, when we meet on that shore, free from all care. Rising up in the sky, telling this world goodbye. Homeward we then will fly, glory to share. My Jesus is coming soon, morning or night or noon. Many will meet their groom, trumpets will sound. All in the dead shall rise, righteous meet in the skies, going where no one dies, heavenward bow. Troublesome times. I'm a little worried. I'm <laughs> getting up here now. So anyway, I'm glad y'all are here. And um, uh, so we are going to... Uh, continue a little bit on our discussion from last week, uh, but before I do that, I told uh, Tommy Casey that I would uh, remind everybody, uh, at least uh, many of y'all, about care group uh, gatherings that will be happening. Um, uh, me and Tommy's group, group number two, will be getting together with Mickey's group, number 13. We'll have more information about that later. So, um, um, anyway. All right. Well, last week we we talked about uh, worldview a little bit, and uh, um, in this, if I can get this going, uh, just as a, a quick review, we had stated that about six percent of Christians have a biblical worldview, and along with that, there's been a uh, breathtaking drop in. Uh, four very important indicators. One is a belief in God. Number two, a belief in the Bible. In fact, 24% of church-going Americans um, only believe in the infallibility of, the, of, of God's Word. Only 24%, which is uh, quite staggering. Also, next, that... Oops, here we go. I'm behind. This is not working. Right. There we go. That salvation... Okay, Salvation is only through Christ Jesus. And what we're hearing more about, especially in social media, is the historical Jesus. You may have heard about the historical Jesus. That's Jesus stripped of all deity, stripped of all the miracles, uh, etc. And so uh, you'll hear more about the historical Jesus at times. And then we have also the possession uh, a decrease in the possession of truly a biblical worldview. And we mentioned last time that there's a pre prominent um, uh, theory that's going uh, along now uh, referred to as the moralistic therapeutic deism, okay, and which is essentially just a mixture of all type of feelings and attitudes um, uh, in terms of how to live your life. And so what we're seeing more and more is, well, not that, um, is a dismissal in absolute truth and a uh, essentially a commitment to uh, personal and subjective moralism. Okay, whatever works for you, it's fine with me. And so we're seeing this 
uh, dramatic rise in what we termed last week as fake Christianity. Some people have called it the progressive left or uh, more often in, in church life, the Christian left. And so they're beginning to embrace more moral cultures. And so we left last time trying to hit a high note here about our uh, admonition uh, from Peter uh, to always be prepared. And that could take on a variety of different forms. And whether it is um, to uh, obviously stay in the word, stay in prayer. But tonight I want to visit one particular uh, area. And that is that we need to be, as I think, a people more understanding of our tendency as human beings to fear man. And so I'm going to use Proverbs chapter 29 as uh, verse 25 as a basis here. And I'm sorry you can't hardly read the one, the red at the top, but this passage states essentially that the fear of man will prove to be a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is kept safe. And so while there is this difference, obviously, between fear of man and fear of God, I'm going to focus tonight on the fear of man. So my first question to you is, why do we so often fear man? Okay, The Bible says that that can be a snare to us. Uh, so why so often do we do that? And so, um, and while we can look at and reflect maybe back when we were teenagers, okay, because we oftentimes buckled under what some people would call peer pressure, okay, or the like, it happens in adults as well. Okay? And so this fear of man is something I think that we have to battle our entire lives. And so the first answer I have to this question, and, and uh, we'll try to see if you have others, is the fear of retribution from others or rejection from others. And there's a number of scriptures, a number of stories that uh, reference this fear of retribution from others. And so, and essentially, I think many times it's because we give them power and or overdue influence in our own lives. So take a look at the first example, which is, in 1 Samuel chapter 15, and you're very familiar with this, and this is where uh, Saul was instructed by God to destroy the Amalekites. And in doing so, he was to, to completely obliterate the country as well as all of the uh, livestock as well. And so during the battle, uh, many people were killed, but the king was spared as well as the choicest of the livestock. And so Saul addressed, I'm sorry, Samuel addressed Saul about this in this particular passage. And notice what he says here. He says, then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. I have violated the Lord's command and your instructions. I was afraid of the men, and so I gave in to them. I was afraid. I was afraid of the men. And again, these men had must have had some type of power or influence that made, I say that loosely, uh, then Saul to make that type of decision. So what we're looking at here are essentially the power brokers. Who are the power brokers in your life? Who are people who have overdue influence or uh, esteem in your life that can sway you away from God? And so um, let's take a look now at the what I call the power brokers in the New Testament because there's, a, there's going to be a common theme here that I think is going to be important. And, and you remember this story in John chapter 9, verse 22, um, the story of Jesus healing the blind man. And, and so after this was done, the Pharisees came to the blind man demanding answers. Who did this? It's the Sabbath. Okay? 
they uh, did wrong in doing so. And so the blind man uh, tried hard to explain exactly what had happened and proclaimed him as Jesus, as a prophet. And so they weren't getting the answers they wanted from the blind man, so they went to the parents. Okay? And notice what happened. Okay? His parents said this, okay? and what they said was, he is of age, ask him. They completely skirted the issue. They wanted no part of the, de the debate. Okay? They said, the parents said this because they were, again, afraid of the Jewish leaders who had already decided that anyone who acknowledged that Jesus was the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Now, it's difficult for us to understand sometimes what that entails. Why would being kicked out of the synagogue be such a big deal? Okay? Well, remember that it was the center of worship. It was the center of, of uh, fellowship among the Jews. And so to be kicked out was essentially to be separated completely from your own people. Okay? And essentially any possibility of salvation or association with God. And so this was a real concern. And so again, the parents in this particular case were afraid. Now, they weren't the only ones, though. They weren't the only ones. Take a look. In Matthew 26, starting in verse 56, okay? But this has all taken place that the writings of the prophets might be fulfilled. Then all the disciples fled. This is, of course, referring to when Jesus was arrested, okay? The troops came along with the Pharisees, and they arrested Jesus and the disciples didn't stand okay, and try to make a defense. Okay? They, again, were scared, and so therefore they fled. Again, they were afraid as well. And even after Jesus died, even after Jesus died, notice in John 19, 38, later Joseph of Arimathea asked Pilate for the body. Now, Joseph was a disciple of Jesus, but secretly because he feared the Jewish leaders. With Pilate's permission, he, took, he came and took the body away. So again, everything was done secretly, secretly because of fear, because of fear. Now, then the last thing before I get to my second point is... And you're familiar with this story as well in Galatians chapter 2, verse 11. When Peter okay, uh, was confronted by Paul, okay, notice what it says in this verse. Okay? It says, when Peter came to Antioch, I, Paul, opposed him to his face because he stood condemned. For before certain men came from James, he used to eat with the Gentiles, but when they arrived, he began to draw back and separate himself from the Gentiles because he was afraid of those who belonged, again, to these power brokers, okay? The people in power, the people in influence, okay? Now, again, why were they afraid, okay? Why, in this case, was Paul I mean, excuse me, Peter afraid. Why were all of these people afraid? Okay. Who do we have to fear? Okay. Well, <laughs> okay. I remember my second grade teacher, she scared me to death. But that's, that's sort of a different issue. Okay. Um, in this case, we don't have religious leaders necessarily that lord it over us essentially, like the Jewish leaders did, especially the Pharisees. So who do we have today that we fear oftentimes? Not as a church. I'm not talking as a church. I'm talking as a society. Who do we have to fear? Okay. And what I'm seeing more and more in the news, okay, I'm seeing social, okay, the social media, 
the social power brokers, okay, that tell us how to act, how to think, and what to do. Okay? And so that's a concern. Um, just the other day, I was uh, listening to a podcast, and um, uh, it stated there that now Facebook recognizes 58 different genders. Now, I'm a biologist, okay? I recognize two of those, okay? But 58? Okay, take a look. Okay? Here they are. I'm not showing you, okay? I couldn't show you, okay? Because, <laughs> no, I couldn't show you the names, okay? Because they were ungodly. And yet, that's the type of society that we're expected to just accept. Okay? Over the last few years, there has been a 4,000% increase in gender dysphoria in the UK. 4,000%. Okay? Used to be, okay, we heard the argument that people were just born that way. Now you don't hear that as much because people are recognizing that they're changing on a whim. Okay? They're going from number 47 down to 53 okay? just because it's the thing to do. Okay? Are we to just accept that and take it for face value for what it is? Okay? That's what some are expecting. Okay? So it's a little disconcerting to say the least. And so what that does, it sets up a lot of confusion and confrontation. Okay. I was listening to um, a lecture the other day, a blog, I guess, from this fella. His name is Lucas Miles, and I'm showing you his book. Let me just let me just say I haven't read it, so I can't recommend the book. But I have heard a couple of his his talks, and they were quite quite good. And he. Speaks here of the Christian left and how the left is basically hijacking the church in America. And of course, they, he uses the word church uh, in the broadest of senses. But he said that Christians essentially address this issue of confrontation in a variety of different ways, but they all have somewhat of a common theme. The first is we worry, let's say for existence that, uh, for example, that a friend of yours decides that they are transgender. Okay, I'm just using that as an example. Okay? The first thing we do is we worry and we talk to them and we try to persuade them out of that. Okay? The next thing okay, is that, if, since that's not gonna work, we become angry okay, oftentimes. Not angry so much at the individual, but angry at the system, okay? Angry at what put them in that situation to begin with. We get angry, okay? And since that's not gonna work, okay, we then okay, turn to apathy, okay? And we just kind of give up and said, I can't do anything. I can't do anything. And then quickly behind that, it leads to silence. And so we just become quiet anymore. We don't really talk about it. We don't want to address it. Number one, it's too painful. But there doesn't seem to be any immediate solutions, at least that we can see. This idea of silence was mentioned um, in uh, a book by Diedrich Bonhoeffer, and he stated this, silence in the face of evil is itself evil. God will not hold us guiltless. Not to speak is to speak, not to act is to act. Okay. The other day I tripped across a story that um, kind of touched me, but I thought I've heard this before. And uh, so I actually called the office and I talked to Rachel. I said, Rachel, I said, has Steve used this in the sermon? <laughs> and she said, I don't think so. So Steve, I apologize if you've used this in a sermon and if y'all have heard this before, but you may have heard it somewhere else. But um, the story was put out by uh, 
a woman by the name of Penny Lee. She was a pro-life uh, activist. And she was given a talk at a pro-life rally. And uh, after this, an old man approached her. And the old man had a story. Okay? And she has entitled, oops, sorry. She's entitled the story, okay? essentially, we just sing a little louder. And I just want to spend uh, a couple of minutes here just reading this quickly. This is from this old man. He said, I lived in Germany during the Nazi Holocaust. I considered myself a Christian. I attended church since I was a small boy. I had heard the stories of what was happening to the Jews. But like most people today in this country, we tried to distance ourselves from the reality of what was really taking place. What could anyone do to stop it? A railroad track ran behind our small church in Germany, and each Sunday we would hear the whistle from a distance and then the clacking of the wheels moving over the track. We became disturbed when one Sunday we noticed cries coming from the train as it passed by. We grimly realized the train was carrying Jews. They were like cattle in those cars. Week after week, that train whistle would blow. We would dread to hear the sound of those old wheels because we knew that the Jews would begin to cry out as they passed our church. It was so terribly disturbing. We could do nothing to help these poor, miserable people, yet their screams tormented us. We knew exactly at what time that whistle would blow, and we decided the only way to keep from being so disturbed by the cries was to start singing our hymns. By the time the train had came, came rattling past the churchyard, we were singing at the top of our voices. If some of the screams reached our ears, we just sang louder until we could hear them no more. Years have passed, and no one talks about it anymore. But I still hear that train whistle in my sleep. I can still hear the cries for help. God forgive us all who call ourselves Christians, yet we did nothing to intervene. And again, that, that hit me like a two by four across the head. And yet, it reminded me too that I lived during this time, okay, when abortion used to be a big deal, okay? Roe v. Wade. I was 13 years old when this came, okay? I didn't, I listened to the news, but I didn't understand it very well. But I remember asking some church people about it, and they said, we don't mix politics and religion. And that was the end of the discussion. By the way, that same year, 1973, Congress passed the Wildlife Protection Act so we can protect eagles. Well, on to better things. Now, there is another reason that I found, okay, why we so often fear man, okay? We want to please other people, okay? In other words, we're people pleasers many times. And this isn't new to us, okay? We see examples of this in Scripture, okay? Take a look in Mark, the 15th chapter, okay? Wanting to satisfy the crowd, you're familiar with this, Pilate released Barnabas to them. He had Jesus flogged and handed him over to be crucified. Wanting to satisfy the crowd, okay? At the same time. In John, chapter 12, Okay, this is a great verse. Okay. You're familiar with it. Yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders, believed in him. Okay. Even among the Jews, many believed in him. But because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith. So what are we saying here? Fear of man does what? It keeps us from being effective, spreading God's word. For they loved human praise more than the praise from God. Okay. All right. Then there's the example of Herod okay, as well. Okay. And you remember the story where Herod had killed James. So when he saw that, speaking of Herod, when he had met the, that this met the approval of the Jews, 
he proceeded then to even seize Peter. Okay? This happened during the feast of the festival of unleavened bread. Okay? It met the approval of the Jews. We do things at times, maybe not intentionally, but we do things sometimes that just to please others, just to please others. I remember one particular instance. I was in graduate school, and we had a new student coming in. His name, he was from China. He had never been to the U.S., and his name was Ho. Okay? And so every time he came into the lab, we said, hi, Ho, you know, and we just, we'd laugh, you know, and he thought it was kind of funny, although he didn't understand uh, kind of how that went. But anyway, um, uh, me and Ho became good friends, and uh, I took him to go grocery shopping for the very first time, okay? And uh, he had never been, and of course, in China, he'd always gone from one market to the next. And so to go to a big grocery store where everything was right there, that was quite something for him. And so I walked in and we went down the vegetable aisle and he started putting every vegetable in the cart that he could find. I mean, it was just, and I was like, whoa, time out. And I said, this stuff's going to go bad before you can eat it all. And I said, have you ever tried, let's go to the canned foods. Canned foods, you know, canned. And he, he never had seen that before. So I took him over there. He said, how do you open it? And so we had to have a lesson on how to open a can, you know, aluminum can. And um, so then we started talking about breakfast. What do you eat for breakfast? And so I said, I got it. I said, let's go to the cereal. Okay. And so he said, what's this? I said, oh, this is, this is, it's like grain. It's really good. And you pour it in a bowl and pour milk over it. No. All right. Milk over, you know, over grain? No. I mean, this was so bizarre to him. And yet, we spent probably three hours in that grocery store, and it was actually more of an education for me than it was for him. But during our time together, and, and we spent many, many uh, days together, we would, um, I, I was able to convince him to come to church, and uh, he started attending church. Well, um, uh, we eventually got into a Bible study, and uh, uh, he said that the reason okay, that he couldn't become a Christian was because his fam he was afraid for his family if the communist government found out. And then something happened that I'd still, uh, I still hate to even admit. But I had another friend who had a lot of medical problems and uh, didn't get to go out much. And so one day, the three of us decided we would go to a movie. And this other friend of mine had uh, said he really wanted to go see this one movie. I wasn't real high on it because it just didn't look as clean as I would have liked. He, he convinced me, okay? I relented, gave in, and sure enough, there were things there in that movie that was shocking, okay, to me, but also to my new Chinese friend. And so as I was putting this lesson together, I thought about this, okay? What was I? I was a people pleaser. I was trying to please everyone, okay? In this case, my Chinese friend had no idea whether that movie was good or not, okay? I should have made the call, and I refused to do that, okay? So, but our goal is not to please others. Our goal should be to please God, to please God, and always stand on that goal. Now, this is given for us in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. Okay. Notice what it says. On the contrary, we speak as those approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. We are not trying to please people, but God who tests our hearts. You know we never use flattery, okay. nor do we put on a mask to cover our greed, not our covid Okay. God is our witness. Okay. God is our witness here. But again, we're not to use flattery. We're not trying here to please people, but to please God. 
Galatians chapter 1 says a similar thing. Am I not, and, and this is Paul speaking, am I now trying to win the approval of human beings or of God? Or am I trying to please people? If I were still trying to please people, I would not be a servant of God. You can't do both. You can't please people, okay, in a worldly sense, and please God and be his servant. Okay? A couple of more passages here. Okay? John chapter 8 talks about Jesus' response to the Father. This is Jesus speaking. The one who sent me is with me. He has not left me alone, he, for I always do what pleases him. So we make it our goal, 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 9, we make it our goal to please him, whether we are at home in the body or away from it. Okay? Always to please God. Okay? And then in Ephesians chapter 8, excuse me, chapter 5, 8 through 10, for you were once darkness, but now you are children of the Lord. Live as children of light, for the fruit of the light consists of all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. Okay. You might remember in last week's talk, Barna mentioned that overall Christians are pretty lazy. Okay. We're not willing to really look and search for the truth. And notice again in verse 4, we need to find out what pleases the Lord. We need to find out. Okay. Now, so that takes me back okay, to this passage here. Okay. Again, in your hearts, revere Christ. Okay. Where is your heart? Where is your heart? And always be prepared. Be prepared. Because the radical Christian left okay, that are buying into all of these things that we're now supposed to buy into, okay, they're ready. They're prepared. Okay. Are we prepared to stand up? Okay. Remember that little circle I showed you. And the last thing we want to do, the very last thing, in fact, we're called to speak out boldly in the faith. We can't be silent. We can't be silent when it comes to the word of God. Okay. So I think uh, this is hugely important, especially in today's world. Okay. And unfortunately, it doesn't just, it doesn't apply just to teenagers. Okay. Sometimes I think, you know, this is something that you need to talk to the teenagers about. I think us adults can use this reminder every once in a while as well. I know I do, okay? But again, when we talk to others, again, doing so respectively, again, is going to be important. Are there any comments, any questions that you might have about this? I have a few more minutes. The, the little ones aren't quite up yet. Yes, Steve. Yes. Um, Facebook quit allowing me to promote my sermon blog because it said that my sermon violated their community standards. Wow. Wow. I found out there's a way around it, so I retitled them. Don't tell them this. <laughs> <laughs> But as long as I put anything in my blog title that said sermon, Facebook would not allow me to promote my blog on my uh, Facebook page. Right, right. Well, I don't even get on Facebook because every time I do, my kids get on to me because I've messed something up. And... Uh, <laughs> so I've learned just to stay off of it. I just look at people's stuff. I don't, I don't, I think I'll like something every once in a while, but I don't get on there much just because I get in trouble with my kids. So anyhow, 
Any other comments, questions? All right, you have to deal with me one more week, so troublesome times for one more week, and after that, I promise you, God, there won't be any more, and uh, you won't have to deal with me for a while. So anyway, I uh, appreciate your attention so much, and uh, so you can visit for a few more minutes, and then we should have the, the uh, kids. Yes. I've got some materials I've got some materials that I can give you. I'd be happy to share those with you. I'd be happy to share those. Is there anything else? All right. Thank you so much. Seven oh nine. Seven oh nine. While they're coming in, we'll sing. <clears throat> how sweet, how heavenly is the sight when those that love the Lord in one another's peace delight and so fulfill the word when each can feel his brother's sigh and with him bear apart when sorrow flows from eye to eye and joy from heart to Good and bright, our wishes all above. Each can his brother's failing sight and show a brother's love. When love in one delight will stream through every bosom flow. When union sweet and dear esteem, every action goes. Love is the golden chain that binds the happy souls above. And he
Dear God, thank you for this day. Help one that are sick and one that are hurt. Help everybody be strong and and healthy. And help people that have the coronavirus feel better. In Jesus' name, amen. I guess it's time for me to do this now. We were, we were just waiting to see if there were any cues. I guess it's time now. <laughs> Today I'll be reading John 32 to 35 about the, about the death of Lazarus. Then when Mary was home where Jesus was and saw him, she fell down at his feet, saying unto him, Lord, if thou hadst been here, my brother would not have died. Then Jesus therefore saw her weeping, and the Jews also weeping which came with her. He groaned in the spirit and was troubled, and said, Where have ye laid him? They said unto him, Lord, come and see. Jesus wept. Then said the Jews, Behold how he loved him. I chose this passage because it shows how Jesus was human just like us and, and had emotion just like us. And, and missed his friend and had... And, and and he missed his friend Lazarus. Good job, Milas. Thank you. Thank you for uh, all the young people. Let's have a closing prayer at this time. Father, tonight we're grateful that we've had the privilege of coming together. Thank you for this church. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for the love that binds us together, for being a part of your family and the unique gifts and talents that each individual brings to this body. Uh, Father, here in our auditorium tonight, we've been reminded of some of the very difficult challenges we're facing within the world today. Help us, Heavenly Father that our conviction in Christ will rise above petty differences of opinion and the things that so often uh, occupy our time and our attention and help us to truly be focused upon those things that really matter. Go with us now as we uh, go to our homes for the remainder of the week. We look forward to assembling on this Lord's Day as we worship you again. In Jesus, we pray. Amen. Good to have you tonight.